Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. There's a long discussion of diversions or distractions, divertissement in French, in Blaise Pascal's Pensées. And he tells us some very important things about why it is that people seek out distractions and, and what role they play. And he positions them ultimately between what we can call the, the final ends for human beings, happiness, and unhappiness or misery. Where do all the distractions that we busy ourselves with, that we occupy our lives with, that we fritter away time on, that we pursue for the sake of fun or, or wealth or so many other things, where do these fit in? Are they part of happiness? Are they necessary for it? Are they, on the other hand, something that leads to misery, or are they a hedge against misery? This is a set of really important questions. And Pascal begins, you know, with some general assumptions in the background that human beings actually do desire happiness, however they conceive of it, and to avoid unhappiness or misery, misère in his, his French. So the question then is, would diversions, whether we conceive of them in terms of the activities themselves or of the objects that they're aimed at or that we might win through them, um, do they really make us happy? And it seems like the answer to that, it's a no-brainer in Pascal's own time and in our own time is, well, yes, otherwise people wouldn't be spending all this money and time and attention on these things. So, you know, we'll look at some examples from his own time, but think of some from our time. Sports, you know, when people go to see their team play in a game that may be, you know, one of a hundred games they'll play this season, or, you know, in some cases, less, much less than that. And they want to see their team win and play well and go to the championship and the uh, decisions of the referees go for them and cheer and all that sort of stuff. Are they, are they making themselves happy? And you could ask, well, why are you there at the tailgate party? Man, because I love this sort of thing. This is what life is all about. That's what some people would say. And they can rattle off all these sports statistics and get into arguments about, you know, whether this person should be drafted or not or purchased or however else it's going on, whether the coach is doing a good job. And pretty soon the whole day is gone. I, I know people who spend their entire weekends frittering it away, moving from one sports game to the next. We can think of many other examples what about games that other people play where they're more actively engaged in it because they're playing a massive online computer game with other people, maybe one where they're shooting things up or there's a role-playing element involved? Well, you know, you can spend a lot of time doing that and there is some engagement and you win some stuff in it, don't you? Medals or prizes but they're all illusory. Any sort of board games are like that, aren't they? Any sort of role-playing games are like that. What about things that are more serious? Things that are not just about games. They may involve some game playing. What about relationships? You know, getting out there, dating, pursuing whatever, you know, object of your affection uh, happens to suit you. Maybe even the, the whole discovery of where do I fit in on the spectrum, right? All of that. Or reading the most books or 
anything you like, being a hobbyist, collecting all sorts of things, getting the most likes in social media. These are all ways in which we divert ourselves. Do these really make us happy? He gives you some other cool examples. He loves the hunting example. People chase after hares. And you can think about all the stuff that goes into hunting. Uh, you know, if you know any hunters or know any fishermen, you know that people can spend hours and hours not just in the activity, but the prep for the activity, and then talking about it afterwards. He also talks about um, a person going to sea or, or besieging a town, commissioning you know, uh, themselves in, in the army, uh, all sorts of other things along these lines. Why do we want diversions? Will they really make us happy? Another key idea that's coming up here as well in terms of happiness, what do we conceive of happiness as being? Do we conceive of it as a state of rest where we've got what it is that we were looking for? Or do we think of it as a state of excitement, a state of ongoing activity? Think about you know, people who their main form of di you know, diversion is sexual relations with others. Is it, is it about being in bed and engaging in all the activities? Is it about the lead up to it? Is it about the bragging rights or whatever happens to be the case afterwards, I don't know, writing some, some sort of letter or <laughs> you know, documenting things in some way. What is it that people are really after here? And why are they after it? Excitement in what? Now, Pascal tells us that the reason why we both seek out diversions and don't really understand why we're doing it, why we spend so much time on them is because we don't understand the human condition adequately. We've concealed it from ourselves. And that's one thing that diversions help us to do. What is our real human condition? There's good points to it, but there are also some bad points. He says that we exist in a state of what he calls natural poverty. We are not as good as we think. We are not as smart as we think. We are not as well off as we think in many different ways. He says there's one real reason, the natural poverty of our feeble and mortal condition. So miserable that nothing can comfort us when we think of it closely. When we think of it closely. That requires a sort of concentration. That requires putting the diversions aside. That requires not answering the phone, not answering the text, not turning to the social media and clicking and finding out what, what the latest scandal is or what the latest uh, puppy picture is or any of those sorts of things. It requires sitting for a little bit. And this, is, this passage has got one of the most famous lines by Pascal. He says, When I have occasionally set myself to consider the different distractions of men, the pains and perils to which they expose themselves at court or in war, Whence arise so many quarrels, passions, bold and often bad ventures? I have discovered all the unhappiness of human beings arises from one single fact, that they cannot stay quietly in their own room. That a person cannot be just by him or herself with their own thoughts. They need other things. They need distractions. So... Diversions or distractions, they help to take our minds off of this, uh, pro this, this, this condition. And they promise us that in some way we're going to enjoy some happiness. And after a while, we do enough of this, they become a need. Or they even become a habit, a second nature for ourselves. There are certain people who cannot focus more than a few minutes and take their mind away from their phone, or from golf, or from you know, the latest news about the cooking world, or gossiping about other things. So another thing that he says is, and this is a very interesting point, and we don't have a lot of kings around these days, but you can think about all the other people who have some degree of power 
He says, the people who you think are enjoying the best life, they need people to provide them with diversions. So he says right here, um, royalty is the finest position in the world. When we imagine a king attended by every pleasure he can feel, if he be without diversion and be left to consider and reflect on what he is, this feeble happiness will not sustain him. He will necessarily fall into foreboding of dangers, of revolutions which may happen, finally of death and inevitable disease. You're going to think about things as they could actually happen. So that if he, if he be with what is called the diversion, he is unhappy and more unhappy than the least of his subjects who plays and diverts himself. So the CEOs, the heads of the university, they pick whatever station in life you like that gives a sort of privilege and priority to that person. They're not really happy to the degree that they are happy unless they can enjoy some diversions, Pascal says. He's got a really great discussion in there about what is it that we're actually looking for? Are we looking for the object of the diversion? Is that what makes us happy? Or are we more happy to be engaged in the activity? He says, there are reasons why we like the chase better than the quarry. And I framed it here in terms of the Motorhead song, the chase is better than the catch. This idea that we, we should constantly be striving. And he says, um, this is all men have been able to discover to make themselves happy, these sorts of things. Those who philosophize on the matter, who think men unreasonable for spending a whole day and chasing a hare, which they, would not, which they would not have bought, scarce know our nature. The hare in itself would not screen us from the sight of death and calamities, the, the natural human condition. But the chase, which turns away our attention from these, does screen us. Then he uses the example of the King Pyrrhus. You may know of him because of the term Pyrrhus. Pyrrhic victory. Uh, he fought against the Romans, and in one of the battles, both sides lost so many soldiers that Pyrrhus said, another victory like this will ruin me. And why was Pyrrhus fighting the Romans in the first place? He was attempting from his kingdom of Epirus in what is nowadays, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Balkans area. He wanted to establish an empire like that of his, you know, not predecessor, but because uh, he wasn't related to him directly, but uh, somebody who he idealized, Alexander the Great. Now, somebody pointed out to Pyrrhus, well, after you've made all these conquests, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to sit at home and drink wine with my friends and enjoy myself. And this guy said, why the hell don't you do that right now? What's preventing you from doing it? And what, it, what was it? He wanted the chase. He wanted the excitement, the activity. And he um, says, as men who naturally understand their own condition avoid nothing so much as rest, there's nothing they would leave undone in seeking turmoil. Not that they have an instinctive knowledge of true happiness, so we're wrong to blame them. He's not trying to criticize here. He's trying to point out a problem that we might get away from. Their error does not lie in seeking excitement if they seek it only as a diversion. The evil is that they seek it as if the possession of the objects of their quest would really make them happy. It's really about the quest itself and not about the object of it. So he says, in this respect, it's right to call their quest a vain one. He also has a really great example here. This drives this point home about diversions in it's a thought experiment imagine that you have a person and every day he's given a certain amount of money and he has to or other resources and he has to use that in some sort of contest some sort of gambling it says um, a man spends his life without weariness and playing every day for a small stake now Let's change the conditions a little bit. Give him each morning the money he can win each day on condition he does not play. Make it a guarantee. No longer require him to gamble. No longer require him to take a chance. No longer require him to exercise some thought or to put something of himself in the activity. 
he becomes bored. He becomes unhappy. Pascal says, okay, so it's, it's the amusement of the play and not the winnings that he's seeking. Let's change the condition some more. He does have to play, but now he has to play for nothing. He can't become excited over that, Pascal says, and he will feel bored. So he says, it's not then the amusement alone he seeks. A languid and passionless amusement would get boring to him, will weary him. He must get excited over it. He has to deceive himself by the fancy that he will be happy to win what he would not have as a gift or on condition of not playing. And he must make for himself an object of passion. The emotions have to get engaged. Uh, he says, excite the passions over his desire, his anger, his fear to obtain his imagined end. This again is something that we can see many instances of. All we have to do is look around. People stir stuff up because they want that excitement. There's another uh, remark that, that Pascal makes that is quite interesting here. And he talks about cases where a person is grieving. He says, how does it come that this man who lost his son only a few months ago or who in this morning was in such trouble be, uh, through being distressed by lawsuits and quarrels no longer thinks of them. And, and we can think of all the other things that we would say make us miserable. Think about our, our bodies. Think about our relationships. Think about our prospects. How is it that distractions or diversions can completely take our mind off of these? Well, it's by inducing some sort of thought that we're going to be happy and providing just a little, little glimpse, not the reality, uh, let alone the totality, but just a little glimpse of what happiness might be. And he notes that this really does work. It's surprising that we can, in fact, be so easily distracted, amused, excited over so many different things. The last thing that I want to stress here is you might say, well, this is all about leisure time and what people do when they're not at work, but some of us are serious. Some of us work really hard and we keep busy and we have people coming to us and making demands on us. I don't have time to be watching Netflix or gambling away or engaging in love affairs or racing cars or pick whatever else you want, right? And there is a truth to that, but that can also become a mode of distraction as well. He has this uh, uh, great passage here, and then there's one a little bit later. He says, what is it to be superintendent or chancellor, first president, but to be in a condition wherein from early morning, a large number of people come from all quarters to see them so as not to leave them an hour in the day in which they can think of themselves. The key issue there is that the opposite of distraction is thinking about ourselves and our actual condition. It's not having real work as opposed to leisure time or puttering around. It's that we don't actually attend to who we really are. So he says, um, when they're in disgrace and sent back to their country houses where they lack neither wealth nor servants to help them on occasion, they do not fail to be wretched and desolate because no one prevents them from thinking of themselves. Uh, a little bit later, he goes on and he says, we're entrusted from infancy with the care of so many different things, honor, property, friends, even the property and honor of our friends. We're overwhelmed with business, with the study of languages, with physical exercise. And here's the kicker. He says, we're made to understand we cannot be help happy unless our health, our honor, our fortune, and that of our friends be in good condition. And a single thing wanting can make us unhappy. So we're given cares and business that keep us busy. As he says, bustling around from the break of day. And Pascal observes, isn't this a weird way to make people happy? Again, we come back to this issue of happiness and misery. Isn't it a strange thing to give us so many things to do to say that this will in fact make us happy? What genuine happiness would consist in 
would be in part to be all right to sit by ourselves for an hour in our room undisturbed with our own thoughts. But so many of us are unable to do that. So sometimes people do that through their leisure activities, their hobbies, their obsessions. Sometimes people do that through work and duties and offices and obligations, but it's all distraction. And so this is worth keeping in mind. What is the distraction really providing us with? Is it, is it helping us escape from misery? Is it really providing us with happiness?